for the introduction. Thanks a lot to Boehringer for the invitation to come here um, to Ren and present you some of the research that we have done on PERS over the last couple of years. Um, Hans made it quite easy for me at the end of the day, and I think I can uh, skip a lot of the introduction because we are running also a bit late, and I rather focus on some of our research data and on the results and skip some of the introductory slides because it's really repeating a lot of what Hans already said. In the end, to just sum up why is PERS still um, a very important virus, it's causing a lot of damage, and you probably as veterinarians know better than the researchers we do uh, being in the lab uh, very often. I brought you uh, some data from the US, probably all of you know these um, estimations of the losses, but in this paper um, there is a split also um, onto what part of the losses are caused due to the reproductive failure and which part is coming from the losses in, in the piglets. And that's why I brought it. In the end, we still have a lot of open questions. Um, Hans did a quite good job in explaining mechanisms of PERS, but still, when it comes to certain details that go on there, there are still a lot of open questions that we cannot answer uh, completely, um, particularly the immune responses and also the immunopathogenesis going on locally in the uterus. There are still open questions, and I will show you some of the research that we are doing in, in this area. So we can skip, I guess, the clinics and what happens. Um, the only one thing that I want to mention that Hans um, did not go into that much detail, we know that PERS first infects the endometrium, so the maternal site, it replicates, it crosses over, and then somehow it reaches the fetus. And the one thing that um, is also important for you as being a veterinarian and doing diagnostics at the end, when the virus reaches the fetus, then it has a different affinity to tissues compared to the piglet after it's born. So it's not the lung um, where it mainly replicates, but it's lymphatic tissues. And this is the one thing to keep in mind when you sample tissues out of an aborted fetus, then rather go and take some lymphatic tissue, don't take the lung. Um, and what we usually do in routine diagnostics is take out the thymus. So this is more or less the most prominent lymphatic tissue that you can find in a small fetus or dead-born piglet. Um, and you see that there is one part here um, that is, um, and the other part here. So you have one uh, part sitting right on top of the heart within the chest, and then the cervical part, cervical portions that here on the left and right side. So very prominent tissue that should be fairly easy to find. So when it comes to the research data that I want to share with you now, it was all acquired in the same reproductive model, but during different experimental studies. But the model was always the same. So we were infecting pregnant gills in the last trimester of gestation. So this is the, um, the st stage of gestation when they are most vulnerable, as Hans already showed you, and when most of the damage and the infection is happening in PERS. Um, so we infected the, them partially into the muscle, partially intranasally. In the future, I think we're going to want to go away from this model and really go only with the intranasal route because the virus really spreads quite fast in the sow, and I will show you that uh, also on our data here. And then we followed the guilt for different time periods, around about three weeks, and we terminated before um, the end of gestation, so before they would actually abort the fetuses, because in this experimental model, you really want the piglets still in the sow, then you euthanize the sow and get your nice sample collection out of the uterus. Um, and the results I uh, want to look into with you today is on the one hand, the preservation status. So how do the fetuses look like? Are they dead or alive until the end? And then also, how, how and where do we find the virus, so um, the fetal infection rate. For all the experiments, we have used different isolates, um, and this was both US types, so PERS-2 and also PERS-1. Um, so I want to start with uh, some results of different PERS-2 isolates and how they look like in a reproductive model, and also show you some research that we have done here in Europe using two different PERS-1 isolates. And in this particular experiment, 
we also had vaccinated groups involved. Um, and we vaccinated the sows um, according to the recommendations of the manufacturer. So before insemination, the gills were vaccinated twice. And then there was a booster vaccination done in mid gestation. And then they were infected with one of the two isolates in the third trimester. So when we come to the results, first we start with fetal preservation. Um, and we had uh, different categories of fetuses, because in the end you need to do statistics, so you need to categorize the fetuses. And this is the way we came up uh, with, with four different categories, as you see them here at the bottom. The viable ones, as Hans told us, he would want to eat those. So they look externally completely normal. Um, we, see don't, we don't see any changes in those. Then during our first experiment, we came up with the second category, um, we call it meconium stained. So they were still alive until we euthanized the sow and, and the litter, but we could see external changes. So the amnion was thickened in those um, and stained with meconium, which was sticking to the surface of those fetuses. And often they also had an edema in the umbilical cord. So those were probably um, acute changes and they were about to probably die. And then we had two categories of dead fetuses more freshly dead, so for only dead for only a few days. So the majority of the surface was still pink and not brown, and then autolyzed, so more brown and rotten, being on the way um, of uh, getting into mummies at some point. Um, so we assume that they are dead for around about a week or so. And then mummies, Hans explained that very well, we don't expect pearls to cause mummies because in mid-gestation it shouldn't um, tra transmit to the fetus and, and, and kill the fetuses. And also we only infected the gills in the third trimester, so at gestation day 85. So in the end, we excluded all of the mummies because we assumed that those were dead before we even infected uh, the sow. So they were excluded from all the analysis. So when we look now, what is the result of the fetal preservation after infection with different PERS-2 isolates? And then here you see our very first experiment where we started off with only three categories. Um, here you have the controls. Of course, one or the other dead fetus will happen in, in every liter. Um, you can imagine you know that very well. And then you see the results for three different PERS-2 strains. And you can uh, on the first glance already see that there are quite some differences here. We have two strains that kill um, way more pigs than this uh, third strain does. So high and lower virulent strains also within type 2. With this particular isolate we then went on and did a bigger experiment with a lot of sows involved and we could confirm nicely around about half of the fetuses um, look normal after infection and the other half shows some degree of external change. So something happening with those fetuses. And here again, we have our controls with very low numbers of dead fetuses. When we come now to PERS-1, how is, how is it looking in the PERS-1? Um, then so far, we only did one experiment. Next year, hopefully, we'll do another um, experimental infection. And in this one experiment, we had six groups involved, as I already mentioned. So we had controls non-vaccinated, non-infected. We had a vaccination control group, so they only got the vaccine, but no infection. And then we had the two different isolates. So one isolate showing here at the top and the other isolate here at the bottom. And we had both isolates used in vaccinated animals. Here are the results for those. And also in non-vaccinated animals. And we can see two things here. One thing that, again, we have a quite huge difference in the virulence, um, so the number of dead fetuses um, very low with this isolate, no matter if animals were vaccinated or not. And then we have a hotter strain, and this is a classical Western European isolate that we found in Austria ever since 2015. And you can see that the level of damage to the fetuses is almost the same as we find it in PERS-2. So we also have highly virulent strains circulating in Europe. The other thing that we see under our experimental conditions with the way we vaccinated the gills here in this experiment, the vaccine protected very well against this infection. So it's a low number of dead fetuses here. And in the non-vaccinated, we had a high uh, level of changes 
And I also brought you some pictures how it looks like in our experiments. So here you have a control litter with very nice piglets, um, all externally normal. And this is one of those litters here that you can see with this meconium stained and also some dead fetuses involved. These are averages though, and I wanna go into a bit more detail and look in individual litters and show you the massive variation that we see in the response of individual gills being infected with the same strain. And here on top, this is the quite uh, virulent type two. And here at the bottom, you have this uh, more virulent type one strain. Um, and each line represents one liter, so one gild with fetuses in the left uterine horn and in the right uterine horn, and again, our four categories of fetuses. And when we start with PERS2 up here, you see that we have litters where we see externally nothing. All of them are fine, nice looking. And on the other hand, we have fetuses where, uh, litters where every individual fetus is changed, is dead. So huge variation, although it was the exact same virus strain grown up in one batch, infected the animals in the exact same way. Um, so huge differences here. And the same is also true for, for the European type. So we have litters where we only have two, three dead fetuses or changed fetuses. And then we have litters where most of the fetuses are, show some level of change. Next, I wanna look at the virus itself. So where can we find it and when can we find it where? Um, and we use different uh, samples to test it all by a PCR technique, by quantifying PCR. So we looked into samples of gilts over time. So from the dam collected serum over time and also tissues at necropsy. So in here we looked into lung, tonsil and different lymph nodes. And then on the fetal part, there was a sample collected from every individual fetus from the uterus, so endometrium, so the maternal part and the fetal part, and then also from serum and from the thymus of the fetus. And let's start off again with PERS2 with some results here. Um, so this is the results from our big experiment. So you see quite a high number of gilts that were experimentally infected in this one. And the height of the bars here shows you the quantities of virus that were present and the numbers in percent gives you the percentage of positive animals. Um, and here you see in serum over time of the gilts, 100% of the animals are viremic on day two. Um, and we have the peak of viremia after around a week or so. And by three weeks after infection, we either find very low levels of virus or it is already gone. So in about 15%, the virus is already gone. And that's also something to keep in mind for diagnostics. When you want to look for the virus in a sow, you only have a, a short window where it's really detectable. But it looks different when it comes to the tissue samples and particularly the lymphatic tissues. So it first replicates in the lung but then the virus also leaves the lung and it persists in lymphatic tissue. So we can find a lot more virus and also in a lot more animals, 100% are still positive in the reproductive lymph node. So more virus here than in the lung. And here is the results of the fetal samples. Um, so the uterus samples, and then you see the thymus where we can find quite high numbers in about 72% of the fetuses from the infected gills. Um, so thymus is a good sample to collect. Then when it comes to the question, when can we find the virus where, we did a time course experiment uh, where we terminated earlier, not after three weeks post-infection, but we killed three infected and one control guild at those different days. So starting very early, already two days after infection, and then trying to see where and where do we find the virus and then continuing on with day five, eight, 12 and 14 post-infection. Um, and the list of samples that were analyzed for each fetus was a bit longer in this experiment. So we did endometrium, the maternal part of the uterus, then the placenta, umbilical cord of the fetus, fetal serum, fetal thymus. And in order to answer the question, is it maybe coming from the neighboring fetus? We also looked at amniotic fluid. So maybe we can find it there earlier before it is actually present in the fetus. And here is the results of, of this experiment. I'm gonna lead you through. It's quite a busy slide, I'm aware. So this is results of day two after infection. Remember we had three infected gilts and here you have the different litters. 
one, two, and three, and the different types of tissues that were analyzed. So endometrium, placenta, the umbilical cord, serum, thymus, and amniotic fluid. And here on a heat map, you see the results of a qPCR. So the white um, fields here um, were below the detection limit, so we got the negative result by PCR. You have fields that say D and Q, so that was detected, but not quantifiable, so very little virus that was present. And then the yellow to dark red are higher and higher amounts of virus that were present here. So what can we see from that results on day two already on the maternal side in the endometrium in the uterus? A lot of virus is already present here, as you can see, quite some uh, orange spots. And already the first um, placental samples are positive. So the virus already made it across the placenta and we already find it in a fetal placenta, but all the other compartments of the fetus are still negative. When we move on now, and look at day five, then we see that number one, we get more virus replicating here in the uterus, um, more, also more positives on the placenta. And we have the first positive samples popping up here in the umbilical cord and also in the serum. But the virus has not yet reached the thymus um, and all the amniotic fluid samples were negative at this time. So when we now move on to day eight, then you see, and then from day 8 to day 12 and day 14, you can kind of see how the virus moves. Um, and you see that also more and more virus is <coughs> present in the uterus and it spreads more into the fetal compartment. So by day 8, we have the first thymus positive samples and then it's more and more samples that get positive here. So in the end, it was quite a fast uh, spread. So kind of surprising that already very early on, you find the virus in, in the uterus and already very early on, it crosses over. Already after day two, we find it in the placenta and on day five, already in the fetal compartment. So when we now wanna look at results uh, of our PERS-1 experiment, then I wanna start with the gild samples again, serum over time. Here again, you have our six groups. Remember, those two were not infected. Then here we have two vaccinated groups, one infected with the lower virulent strain, one infected with the higher virulent strain. Then the two infected, uh, uh, non-vaccinated, and then again infected low virulent and high virulent strain. And here is the serum over time of the gills. What was a bit surprising, and I did not uh, expect this result, is that in the vaccinates, we hardly find any uh, viremia after infection with both isolates. But in the non-vaccinates, it's the results as expected. Um, so by day six, they are all viremic and we find quite a lot of virus in the blood. When it comes to the tissues of those animals, and that was good at the end, that at least in every, in every single infected animal, we've also found virus so that we could confirm that our infection model worked at the end of the day. But we see there is a lot more virus present in the non-vaccinated groups. Um, and now comes the results of the fetuses. And we have each group on an individual slide. I will guide you through again. So again, you have a heat map depending on the amount of viruses that were present. And this is the group that was vaccinated first and then infected with the lower virulent strain. Here on top, you have the four uh, individual litters again with the fetal preservation, how that looked like. So did we see external changes in those fetuses? And here you have PCR results of endometrium for each individual fetus, fetal placenta, fetal serum, and fetal thymus. And you can see that in this group, we did not find any virus back. When it comes to the vaccinated group infected with the high virulent strain, we found more virus, but it was also fairly little that was present in two liters here on the maternal side. And then on one liter, the virus also managed to cross over and we also found it in the fetal compartment. But again, very few uh, positive samples. The picture looks a bit different when it comes to the non-vaccinated animals. Here is the lower virulent strain where you can find some quite some virus replication here on the maternal side and it did cross over to the fetal placenta, also in the serum and thymus in some of them. And then you also see that we have higher viral load. So more viruses replicating um, in those animals. 
And the picture looks completely different when we now come to the high virulence strain in non-infected animals. So you see the virus is all over, um, particularly in the uterus, both on the maternal and on the fetal side, but also high levels of virus within the fetal compartment. But to remind you again, when we look at the results in fetal thymus, look at the differences in the number of infected piglets, and that's something to keep in mind when you do diagnostics again. There are litters where from 15 fetuses, we only have three infected. Um, and we also run a diagnostic lab, and very often when it comes to abortions and diagnostics, we get one or two fetuses submitted. So when you collect one or two, or two out of this litter where every individual one is infected, you might be lucky and find the virus. Um, but then out of this litter, your chances are probably high to also miss an infection. So for us, that's why we recommend to really take samples from a lot of fetuses out of the litter and rather pool them for the diagnostics. And you can easily do that. And in the end, I want to show you a bit more basic research that we are doing. Um, and this is looking at immune responses, particularly in the maternal fetal interface. So which immune cells are involved locally? Because as Hans explained, it's a very, very interesting location because we have this fetus that is half foreign from an antigenic perspective of the sow. Um, and this comes together with, with the mother in this maternal fetal interface. And on the one hand, we have to have an effective immune response that is combating pathogens. But on the other hand, we also don't want a rejection of that fetus. And that's why this uh, location from an immunological point of view is quite interesting. So this is the methodology, how we work with it. Uh, we mechanically separate the two layers of epithelium, so the maternal endometrium from the fetal placenta. And I brought you some pictures how that looks like in real life. So first you trim off the myometrium and then with forceps you simply separate the two layers. And then we put it in a digestion buffer, so with enzymes, um, and then isolate the immune cells out of that. And then we put it in a flow cytometer after we stain it with some markers on the surface so that we can identify which immune cells are, are involved there. Uh, and then we have hopefully some good results, which I want to show you only uh, some of those. I know that for you as being veterinarians, looking at uh, those dot plots from um, flow cytometry is probably not that easy when you're not used to that. But I want to give you two examples of cells that might be involved and are quite interesting for us to look into more detail. And the one is CD8 T cells. So these are the cytolytic T cells. Those are that are in charge of damage of, of killing damaged or infected cells at the end. Um, and those are all the cells that are here in this bracket. So we stain for the marker CD8 beta and then can identify them. And here you see them in the maternal endometrium and in the fetal placenta of control animals and then of animals infected with low and high virulent PERS. And here are the numbers at the end of the day. And those are all six groups that we had. So control here on the very left, and then the vaccinated groups are here in the middle, and the two non-vaccinated are here at the very right, the low virulent and the high virulent. And these are the, the number, the frequencies. So how many of those CD8 T cells do we see locally in the maternal endometrium? This is the results here at the top. And in the fetal placenta here at the bottom. And what we can clearly see is from the controls compared to the infected, we see an increase in cell numbers. But it's not only an increase in numbers, but also the phenotype of those cells changes. Uh, and that's something that we look into this with a different marker. So naive cells are sitting here on the right. Um, so those are cells that have never had uh, contact to any antigen. And when they have experienced antigen uh, contact, then they move here to the left and they become negative for CD for this marker CD27. And when we only compare the extreme groups, so the controls and the non-vaccinated infected animals, then can, we can see that particularly in the fetal placenta, we can see a massive drop in naive um, effector cells, uh, which probably tells us that they have antigen contact here locally. And in contrast, this early effector phenotype, so the ones that already had antigen contact, increase after PERS infection. 
Um, and those are cells that, are, that, that, that have the capability of really causing damage and killing. Um, and that might be one of the mechanisms locally that those cells get activated there and cause apoptosis and cause cells to die and the separation of maybe the placenta from the endometrium and then are involved in the cause of uh, the death of the fetus and the abortion at the end. And the other cell population that we have a particular interest in is natural killer cells. So NK cells, those are cells that are also there to kill infected or also tumor cells, so that are very important for the immune system. But in the uterus, they have a different role. So we know from uh, research that in mouse and uh, also in human, uh, in the reproductive tract, those NK cells have a down-regulating function. So they keep the, the, the environment quite calm when it comes to the immune response. And probably that's very important in order to prevent the rejection of the fetus. And we don't really know a lot about the uterine and K cells in pigs. Not much research has been done on looking in their function. Are they also really down-regulating the immune response? And this is something that we're going to focus on in the future. For now, what I can tell you is that we definitely see an increase in numbers of those NK cells, both in the fetal placenta and also in the maternal endometrium after PERS comes along, after PERS infection. Um, but our goal is really to look into that, what happens with this NK cells in a regular pregnancy, what are their functions, and we are at the moment uh, developing assays to also not only look at the phenotype of those cells, but also look at their function. So are they killing other cells or are they really down-regulating the immune response locally? And what happens after PERS comes along? Do those uh, um, cells change their activity maybe um, after PERS infection? So this is some of, of the research that we are actually doing and hopefully for the future in our next experiment get some um, nice results. So with that, I want to come to the conclusions. Um, so we see definitely a high variation in the virulence of different PERS strains, and this is true for uh, both PERS-2 but also PERS-1. But even with the same isolate in, a, in an experimental model, but also in the farms, I think uh, you see the same thing. We have a high variability in the response of individuals. And in our case, in our experiments, it was as extreme that we had between zero to 100% of fetuses within a liter of gills that were infected with the identical PER strain that showed some change, uh, external change, some pathological changes. And also, this is true for the infection rate. Also there, we have a high variation. So we might have litters with a lot of infected piglets, but then we have litters with only a few. And I think this is something that is very important to keep in mind when you do diagnostics. From the time course experiment, we can conclude that the fetal infection starts very early. So we found the virus uh, in the placenta already on day two and in the fetal compartment starting at day five after infection. And in our experimental model, the vaccination with the MLV in that under, under our experimental settings, protected well against this highly virulent PERS-1 strain that we used in our experimental model. The conclusion of the uh, investigation of the local immune responses so far uh, in the maternal fetal interface, we have a clear difference in the phenotype of the immune cells that are present in the maternal endometrium and in the fetal placenta. So on the maternal side, we have more antigen-experienced cells, which is clear, I think. We have adult animals, while in the fetal placenta, there are a lot more naive immune cells present. And during the infection with PERS, we see an activation of those cells. Um, and in particular, we are interested at this point in two cell types. So it's the NK cells, where we see an increase uh, both on the maternal side and on the fetal side, so in the endometrium and in the placenta after PERS infection. And then also the effector T cells, particularly in the CD8 T cells. And one of our questions is, do they then contribute to transplacental PERS infection and also to the damage that is going on? There are some other models, for example, from um, meningeal uh, malaria in, 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 in humans, where there might be uh, some 
similar mechanism that CD8 T cells are doing some local damage, um, allowing the uh, blood brain barrier to be leaking. Um, so maybe something similar is going on here. And that's something that we want to focus on in our research in the future. So with that, I hope I did stick to the time. And thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you.